We're going to go to the next panel, building trust in a moment of political division. Please welcome to the stage Elizabeth Vargas, News Nation, and our esteemed panel. That music is something, isn't it? It feels, feels like we're supposed to be walking out with sashes on. Um, <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Vargas. Um, I anchor Elizabeth Vargas Reports on News Nation, and I'm happy to be here with Joanna Masca, who was formerly with the State Department, um, and not the State Department, with the Obama administration, and Morgan Ortegas, who was formerly with the State Department in the Trump administration. So we are a bipartisan or both represented, uh, parties represented here, to talk about the polarization um, in politics and in the country. Um, we hear a lot of people saying um, it's the worst it's ever been. And sometimes, I've got to be honest, it feels like it. The, the dialogue that we have, not just in the halls of Congress, um, but on television and on social media, seems more fraught and more divided and more mean-spirited than ever. I wanted you both to comment briefly on if you think it's as bad as I just described, and is it the worst it's ever been? Joanna, you start. So I would say, as a public school mom, I see it on the playground. I see our kids feeling this toxicity of our politics, of this moment, and the things that our leaders say matter. So when they say terrible things about one another, our kids are listening. And it frustrates me so much, Elizabeth, because we are better than this as a nation. And for some reason, we can't seem to get over ourselves and realize that in the moment. And I think we really need to check ourselves before we speak, and leaders have an ultimate responsibility of this moment that we're living in. Yeah, <laughs> she deserves the clap. Um, I, I, I agree, but I will say, because I agree, it's why forums and places like these are more important than ever. And so I just want to thank Matt Swift and the entire Concordia team um, for having us, because unfortunately, so uh, w they're both at News Nation. I go on News Nation a lot. I go on a lot of the various channels. Um, and News Nation is one of the only places where you're bringing uh, hardcore Republicans and Democrats together. Concordia is one of the only places that's doing this as well. There's so there's such fewer and fewer forums. It's very siloed right now. It's very siloed. So people are going to left or right media outlets to reinforce what they would like to hear. Um, and it's hard to have bipartisan conversations. You know, Joanna and I are on a show called The Hill a lot, which is airs at 5 p.m. Eastern on News Nation. <laughs> um, and when we're on that, we have to discuss uncomfortable things sometimes. I have to criticize the president, the current president, who she uh, has, you know, worked for. And but we're able to be respectful respectful and have a dialogue and have a conversation, even sometimes when we vehemently degree, disagree with each other. So I would say, is the polarization, to answer your question, is it worse than ever? I'm in my 40s, so yes, but I think if there's people in the room, as you and I talked about, Elizabeth, that lived in the Vietnam era, might say it's been worse. We did have a civil war in our country's uh, history, so I think there are times when the rhetoric has been worse. But if we can all make a commitment to ourselves that I'm not going to just sit in my own little tribal corner, but I'm going to get out of my corner and I'm going to have tough conversations conversations uh, with people, whether it's at Concordia or on News Nation, then that's how we move the country forward. How do we move the country forward or come to a consensus on anything when it seems like two sides and so many people can't even agree on the basic facts of something? I mean, it's one thing to debate a policy. It's one thing to debate the border. It's one thing to debate abortion rights. It's, you know, but you have to have an agreement of what the facts are. And it, Morgan, it was during the Trump administration that Kellyanne Conway notoriously said, well, there are alternative facts. And it's sort of like when you start having that kind of, well, no, your facts are incorrect, here are my facts. 
does that contribute even more to the polarization? Well, I think you're getting to the larger heart of the problem, which has been discussed previously on the disinformation panel and sort of who is the arbiter of truth. And there, the fact is, is that there is a lot of people, half this country, um, does they do not have faith in some of the mainstream institutions. I mean, if you look at young people in this country right now, there's so many of the big institutions that they believed in that have failed them, right? Most young people, and if you're 21 years old, more likely than not, your parents are divorced. So the institution of marriage failed you. You probably don't have a lot of faith in organized religion. You're probably not going to a temple or a church anymore. And there's such lack of faith now in the government and in, and in media in general. So we're not only fighting the polarization. I think uh, we're fighting distrust in the institutions that are at our country's core, that are at our founding. Saying that, I always say two things. Number one, for a long time, a lot of people in this country felt left behind because there was a bipartisan consensus. Actually, you know, for about 20, 30 years, Republicans and Democrats agreed on trade, agreed on a lot of the issues that people in inner cities and in rural areas felt like that bipartisan consensus on those policies actually left them behind. So I think there is an argument that we do need different parties, but I also say we can also focus on the things that do unite us. The China Select Committee in the House, led by uh, Mike Gallagher, is a, is a very bipartisan committee where they're debating uh, what could be, un, you know, hope, well, God forbid, hope not, but could be the next war that this country faces. If you look at crime in, in major cities, you know, crime doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, registered independent, or you've never voted. And I think parents around countries and big cities are wanting to figure out common sense solutions uh, to the massive crime wave around this country. So I do think we also have to focus on areas where there is really important agreement. And I would say China and crime in our cities are two places that a lot of us could have a civil conversation on. Well, and I would just add, you know, there's a certain degree of arrogance sometimes in politics and in political circles that we believe that we know everything better than someone else. I mean, my I was having a tough conversation in Kansas with um, my brother this weekend where, you know, he had all sorts of concerns going back to George H.W. Bush and his affiliation with the CIA. And I had to stop and instead of telling him he was wrong on some of this and the connections and that the CIA was the one who ultimately got him the presidency, I had to say, where did you get that information? And the, the truth is people are living in their own bubble and they're getting a lot of this fed by foreign actors who are trying to drive us apart from one another. And so I think we have to have a level of humility in which, you know, it's not like, oh my God, you're so wrong. <laughs> like It's where are you getting that information? And then, okay, so where is it that I can provide you the information that I have, because, you know, that may conflict with what information that they have. And um, people don't like to be wrong much. But how do you, and, and listen, you know, we see this over the 2020 election. Yeah. And and former President Trump on television again this week saying it was stolen and his followers believing it was stolen, even as other Democrats and Republicans say it was not stolen, even as members of his own administration say it was not stolen. So in other words, we're still th that one thing. It's a black and white thing. It either was or wasn't. It couldn't have been halfway so. Um, and there are military veterans. There are military members who felt like it was stolen so much that they ran, they were part of January 6th. And that breaks my heart, Morgan. And that's why, you know, I really do think I am hopeful that the Republican Party can hold President Trump accountable for that. Um, and if he, they don't, I do believe that the Democrats are going to try very hard because I, I still believe there are more of us that realize that it was not stolen, but people have been indoctrinated and they believed that they were there fighting for the right purpose. And it's just to back up and imagine, you know, what could have led a member of our military to the Capitol with a noose on January 6th, something is seriously wrong with this moment and i i think we have to you know call that out and also talk about you know president trump was responsible for that so 
It's interesting because the title of this panel is Building Trust in a Moment of Political Division. And I think the first way to not build trust is to make everything about Trump, um, which is why I uh, you know, brought up areas of what I think are bipartisan consensus so far on China and the crime in cities. You know, One of the most fascinating topics, like I'm a policy person. I don't run campaigns. I'm not a part of politics. Um, I've been in the last four administrations. And so I look at, I think that when you start talking about political personality, uh, everybody's hair on their arm raised. People start to get really defensive, which is why I like to take the, the approach of let's talk about policy. The border, as Elizabeth mentioned, is another place where, you know, it's interesting. You'll see Democrat congressmen and other Democrat elected Democratic officials on the border and the mayor of New York City criticizing their own party's president for policies that they think Severely. are dangerous. He's been and, very, very vocal and very, yeah. very critical. And so I think that, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, the thing that gets people's hair on fire is to talk about Hunter Biden, right? Or to talk about Trump or whatever it is. Maybe we should just stop talking about the personalities and let's talk about the policies. Uh, like I just mentioned in the border where you have border state Democrats saying that this, we're elected officials, this doesn't work for us. You obviously have Republicans criticizing and now you have enough uh, migrants in major cities like here in New York that it's become taxing on this city as well. So how do we have, uh, you know, a country that uh, lives up to the principles of, of allowing immigrants around the world and sort of lives lives up to our founding? We all came here uh, as immigrants. Um, how do you have that and respect those ideals from our founding, but still also at the same time have a secure, uh, have a secure and not an undefended border? I think we can have those policy conversations. And if we're going to build trust amongst and during a politically divisive time, let's talk about policy. Yeah. Let's talk about like, you know, every Everybody who has kids in this room. Um, mine was born two days after the election, so she wasn't in school during COVID. But anybody like you who had kids uh, in school during COVID, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Your kid, you know, you probably feel like your kid got left behind for a few years while they were trying to learn on an iPad or trying to learn on a computer. Governor Youngkin of Virginia is offering, he just announced this, uh, new tutoring lessons for kids that have been left behind in, in public school in Virginia. And I'm sure there's some we Democrat have that in California. California. Which is which is great. But see, look, so there's so so let's as moms, as parents, let's come together and talk about the fact that the the children that got hurt the most and got left out of school during the most during COVID are the kids who probably their parents could not afford a tutor, right? Could not afford all the expensive things to, to make sure that their child wasn't left behind. I think that, you know, it's so dangerous what happened for, for our kids being out of school for over two years. We see it now in our reading scores and our math scores and, and all of the tests. And it's not going to be one party that's going to solve. We have an entire generation, especially of lower income kids that got left behind during COVID, and you need Republicans and Democrats to solve that together. Thank you. It, it is true, and I think for all of us who have kids, we recognize this problem, and yet it is, when we start talking about all of the problems, sometimes what I see is we border on the edge of calling more questions in our institutions instead of figuring out how we can improve them, right? And so to your point, you know, yes, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We can't um, we can't, you know, we can talk about policy all day and we find different areas of agreement, but the personalities that are going to be on the stage this year, if the Republicans elect Trump again, I believe that our political division is going to get worse before it gets better. And I am very concerned, you know, I, I will be the first to criticize the Democrats. And I think we all have to be, um, really, you know, we have to look at our own parties and our own politicians with the same eyes we want each other to look at their own party and their own politicians and question the behaviors. So I will call out, I do not like the Democrats talking about MAGA extremist Republicans. There are people in this country who have different views and they may be different, but you don't have to call them out as extremists. I want the Republican Party to also call out what Trump does on stage, and it's not just a personality, but it and it's not just him. It's a ton of Republicans who are talking about these deep state Democrats, or they're talking about the liberal cabal, or whatever that is. And it's like, I always am amazed, by the way, 
at how, uh, you know, the Republicans will veer from Democrats can't get anything done in government. And yet they're manipulating like Nancy Pelosi is literally cooking the COVID virus herself in China. It's just always amazing. And it takes like <laughs> the liberal cabal, the modern version of the vast right wing conspiracy. It's, I mean, it's amazing. But we can't talk about our, uh, each other and, you know, like that without having the that feed into this narrative that's just going to destroy ourselves, our institutions, and the ability to work with each other. How much do you think social media um, plays a role in all of this? And I, I, I'm, I'm, we have politicians who take to Twitter and fire off, you know, fiery, sometimes really nasty tweets. Uh, that get a lot of traction and get repeated and reverberate through, you know, the ether. Uh, we know we have Russia and China, which are actively launching campaigns uh, using bots to sow dissension uh, because they know that an weakened America is good for them, that they will weaken us and our democracy if they can sow dissent and disgust about the other side rather than focusing on the policy agreements. And, OK, we genuinely disagree about this or that, but here's where here are the other parts that we can agree on. And we can certainly all agree on our allegiance to this country. So I'm just curious how much of a role you think that plays pointing out something you said to me backstage, Joanna, is that most of the people who are typing away on social media are doing it alone. They never they never have to look somebody in the eye and say that nasty comment or phrase. Yeah. They're doing it at their keyboard. And I was saying to Elizabeth, sometimes I get those very nasty comments. And you know, my 11-year-old son also sees these comments like we were talking about. And um, I try to follow back the person, especially if they're real. And then they'll be like, why did you follow me? <laughs> and I'll be like, well, because, you know, we must have something in common. And then they'll be like, we have nothing in common, you liberal whatever. And then uh, eventually I'll be like, well, it looks like you have kids. I have a kid. That's something in common. And so, you know, slowly but surely when they're real people, you can actually break through that cycle. And there's a great book, Unfollow, uh, by Megan Phelps Roper, who uh, was Fred Phelps' um, granddaughter. And of course, if you are not aware of Fred Phelps, he was protesting all of the uh, military funerals. Just And she talks about actually coming out of the cloud of that um, indoctrination by people reaching out to her on social media. Now, <laughs> the bots that you talked about, that's like so many bots. And I, I remember when we used social media for the Obama campaign, I mean, we were using Facebook to uh, fundraise, to get people together. And I think that we fed into this situation now where there's a completely unregulated social media atmosphere that is dividing us and being used by foreign actors. Yeah, it's so interesting because in the first term of the Obama presidency, I was in uh, the Middle East. I was the Treasury attache at the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, um, and that was during the Arab Spring. And so this was 2011, and it was fascinating uh, to watch the Arab Spring because it was happening on Twitter. So this is back in the young, naive days of, of Twitter and social media. And at the embassy, you know, we we obviously, you know, I, I was headed to Egypt. We see. Uh, happened in Tunisia and then we see Mubarak fall and it starts to proliferate throughout the Middle East. And one of the interesting things about what happened in the Arab Spring is as how much the, especially the young people, and this was the first time we really saw this, were gathering uh, because they were able to use Twitter and other social media outlets. And so uh, we naively thought at the time, like, wow, isn't this, is, this is going to make the world more democratic because everyone's going to have access to social media and they're going to be able to, to you know, to log on and, and create positive revolutions. That it was seen that way. It was. Yeah, you remember that. And so obviously a lot has changed. Covered. As a parent, it, it scares the hell out of me. My daughter is going to be three soon. Um, I, I'm going to lock her away when she's a teenager. I'm not giving her some. Don't let your son look at the social oh, media. Oh, yeah. It's, My sons are, are both teenagers. Oh, gosh. And yeah. It's they, going to be hard. <laughs> I mean, we might want to like let you in on a secret. To control your kids is really it's difficult. Impossible. 
<laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. I made a little mini me so I can see that. Um, but there are some, I, and I don't know that I agree with these proposals, but you did see Elizabeth Warren and Senator uh, Graham come together on uh, on a policy to regulate social media. I have to look at it closer. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with it. But the point is, at least you have people trying to do something because we have spent so much time barking at the wind at social media and so few time coming up with solutions. That's why I get back to my theme of this discussion is, is uh, I believe if we actually sit down and start focusing on policy and drown out the noise, we can talk about things like social media, our kids being left behind because of COVID, crime in cities that affects everybody, uh, China, the border, the border all of these things. Um, and, and let's give praise to the people. You may not agree with their solution, but let's give praise to the senators and the members uh, of the House who are at least trying to come together and find those solutions. Uh, we're about out of time. You had mentioned you think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um I want you to tell me what you think will make that turn happen. Like, what do you, what do you see is going to happen for it to finally hit bottom and start to go back up? And then, Morgan, I'd like you to weigh in on that too. Hopefully, on a hopeful note, ladies. Yes, we are we are going completely. to have to end with a hopeful note. But look, I am watching um, two parties who are controlling who is going to get to vote for their nominee. Um, and I would argue that, uh, you know, w with what we were talking about, you know, with Nevada has just manipulated the process such that President Trump is almost assuredly going to get all of the delegates for that. The majority of the American people, and I said this, we were on election night together, do not want President Trump or President Biden. But those are going to be our options. And there's going to be a lot of soul searching in this moment. I don't know who we're going to end up with. And I want to set the stage with whoever it is. Let's not protest. Let's figure out how we're going to support an administration and figure out policy angles that are going to work moving forward. And yet, you know, we are going to see, I believe, if President Trump was reelected, we would see massive protests in the street. It would be enormously ugly. President Biden is reelected. I'm not sure. I do know that there would be anger and frustration again. Um, and so that afterwards, it doesn't really matter who wins. We're going to need a new generation of leadership because these guys are older than Bill Clinton. Yeah. And so my hope is that those of us who are young, who are have the energy to get involved, can and must at every level. And maybe we'll even see multiple parties come out of this. Do we do we still count as being young? I, I I still I said to my mom, am I uh, over the hill? And she said, um, I think you are. <laughs> I would say something that Joy and I uh, have talked about before and something and on something hopeful. Um, and maybe I feel like I'm going to start a, a campaign on this. I, I see Dr. Healy, Carrie Healy in the audience, who is lieutenant governor of Massachusetts and has done a lot of great bipartisan work. Um, we need term limits. And I think that, you know, it, it's not about age. You could start at a young age and be in Congress, you know, for too long. We have term limits on the presidency. We have term limits uh, at most states on, um, on the governor. So what do you races. say to people who say elections are term limits? Like, obviously, the constituents of that district wanted Senator Mitch McConnell. Money, Senator money in politics. Morgan, I think that's money fair, but politics. we do, but we do have term limits at the at most gubernatorial and presidential levels. If we really want to change Washington, stop their ability to stay there for their whole lives and their whole careers. Like, find another job. Yeah. And money in politics. And then I guess the last thing I would say is just, um, you know, with our new generation of leadership, we have to give them oxygen for them to actually get the attention so that they're recognized, which I'm very proud that we're doing on News Nation, I believe. Ladies, thank you so much. Joanna Masca, Morgan Ortegas, thanks for a great discussion. Thank you.